Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. FYI, for your information, another in a series of special reports produced by WTVJ News. Tonight's program, Voices of Delinquency, is brought to you by Chase Federal Savings and Loan Association who invite you to save where thousands save, and say as thousands say, for my money, it's Chase Federal. The term juvenile delinquent means many things to many people. It can be applied to a youngster arrested by police for committing a crime, or sometimes any teenager who is difficult to handle, who pays little attention to the desires of his parents, qualifies for that label. The child who skips school and sneaks off with his buddies is oftentimes called a delinquent. In short, the term is loosely applied to those boys and girls who don't act within the framework of what you believe is the norm of youth behavior. This FYI report is about delinquents. Rather than present a definition of the term, we have taken the route of letting the subjects speak for themselves. All of them have been committed by Dade County Juvenile Court to the children's home in South Dade, commonly called Kendall. Now, how and why did they get there? What can be done to rehabilitate them to society? What can be done to prevent other youngsters from taking the same route which leads to Kendall? You're looking now at a group of Kendall youngsters engaged in a group discussion of their problems. In a few moments, we will listen to these voices of delinquency as they tell their own stories. But first, Let's take a close-up look at the moderator of that discussion. You can't recognize him or the other youngsters because it is our purpose not to reveal their identities. The moderator's name is Mike. Let's look at his case history to determine how he arrived at Kendall. This is a factual case. The participating people in this news film report are the actual characters of this story of delinquency. This is Mike's school in Miami's Northwest section. As you look at the students, it is difficult to recognize those who may become delinquent. As they sit at their desks in the classroom, the boys and girls in this 11th grade behave like youngsters in similar school rooms in other communities. This is Mike. He will later be moderator of our Voices of Delinquency discussion. While the teacher explains with blackboard markings the topic under discussion, Mike's thoughts are elsewhere. He daydreams and draws figure eights on his notepad. For this student, school holds no attraction. He cannot concentrate, he cannot absorb, nor become interested in the subject material. Soon, Mike begins to skip classes. Before long, he just doesn't show up for school on certain days. He begins a record of truancy. The teachers and guidance counselors at the school try to put Mike back on the right path. No improvement is noted. The next step, one of Dade's visiting teachers is asked to help. Mrs. Carolyn Jenkins makes her case notes based on in-school interviews. She next goes to Mike's home and investigates the boy's relationship with his parents, determines if his need for love, affection, and feeling of being wanted are being met. The father, a cab driver, admits to being an alcoholic, but says he has joined AA. The mother is nervous, high-strung, 
She works as a telephone operator. She says Mike, at an early age, had to assume the responsibility of caring for his two brothers and one sister. Several weeks later, Mike's school truancy causes the juvenile court to put him on probation. Assistant probation officer Bill Shapiro takes over where the visiting teacher, Mrs. Jenkins, left off. Shapiro learns that the parents argued much. The home environment was one of conflict. That Mike was having a tough time at age 16, accepting the great responsibility of running the family. One day soon after, Mike violates his probation. Keys left in a parked car proved too much of a temptation. He steals the car. The parental conflict, Mike's feeling of being neglected, his inability to assume the burden of carrying the family problems is transformed into a joyride in a stolen car. Next stop for Mike is the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court of Dade County. After his arrest by Miami police, Mike is placed in Youth Hall, the detention facility for the court. Originally built about 10 years ago, Youth Hall had accommodations for 100 youngsters. Now, its population has swelled to 138. Boys and girls stay at Youth Hall to await disposition of their cases by Dade's two juvenile judges, William Culbreth and Dr. Ben Shepard. The place is so crowded, youngsters must sleep on mattresses on the floor. Sometimes it is necessary for a boy or girl to remain in Youth Hall up to three months because accommodations are not available at the county children's home or the state industrial schools. After a week in Youth Hall, Mike's case comes before senior juvenile court judge William Culbert. At the hearing are Mike's mother and father. His probation officer, Bill Shapiro, is there, along with Mrs. Jenkins, the visiting teacher. The judge gets a thorough briefing on Mike's past in order to decide what to do about his future. Mike is now at the crossroads of his life. Like most delinquents, his home environment has started him on the road to trouble. The answer now lies in getting him in a more wholesome environment. Judge Colbert gives his decision. Well, son, I'm sorry about this. We gave you an opportunity to get yourself straightened out on probation. But now the probation officer tells me that not only did you continue to cut classes at school and misbehave there, give the dean and the teachers a lot of trouble over there, but now you've gone out and taken this automobile. I don't understand why you could not cooperate, but since you have not, I'm going to do what I promised to do. And that is, I'm going to commit you to the Dade County Detention Home. Now, Mr. Officer, the, the order will read that this boy is committed to the Dade County Detention Home for a period of six months, or until he is sooner legally released. Now, that means, son, that you can earn your way out of that institution in a shorter time than that by cooperation in your cottage, by doing well in school, and obeying the rule. Now, I hope that you will take advantage of this period of time and get yourself straightened out. And that will be all. The county children's home at Kendall houses both delinquent children and dependent youngsters, those who, through no fault of their own, do not have necessary parental support. Kendall puts its charges through an intensive learning program in school. Many of the teenagers are hardly able to read, the result of years of their neglected lessons and complete disinterest in learning. At Kendall, an effort is made to encourage and develop latent creative abilities. In the belief that nothing makes the man like the outdoors, boys raise vegetables and plant life. Most delinquents are hostile and antisocial when they enter the home, but they calm down and learn to adjust to their group life in their new environment. There are 261 boys and girls at the home. About half are delinquent. Superintendent Robert Taro is not happy over intermixing delinquent and dependent children, but limited facilities make it necessary to do so. The home operates on the point system. A delinquent, if he performs well in the classroom, receives a maximum of two points a week. He also gets two points if he obeys the behavior rules in the cottage. Thus, on good behavior, a youngster can chalk up a total of four points a week. It takes a minimum of 48 points before a delinquent can be released from Kendall. Thus, a minimum stay of 12 weeks is required at the home. 
Some youngsters have been there as long as 24 weeks. The youngsters are assigned to cottages, where up to now they have had private rooms. But the backlog of delinquents housed at Youth Hall, waiting for admission to Kendall, is causing the home to put double-deck bunks in several rooms to increase the cottage population from 16 to 20. The youngsters have a vigorous recreation program. Some people think community recreation is the big preventive to delinquency because it keeps children occupied and supervised. It is true that such activities at Kendall provide guidance and supervision for the youngsters such as this Friday night dance. But in the community, wise use of leisure time can be expected mainly from fairly happy, well-adjusted young people. Most potential and actual delinquents do not have these characteristics. Many people in Dade County contribute volunteer time to helping these kids in need. Volunteers conduct weekly sessions during which delinquents act out parts in a courtroom drama. This mock trial gives them a chance to express themselves and make decisions. Under close supervision, most kids try hard at Kendall. Mike, for example, is due to be released tomorrow. He stayed only the minimum time of 12 weeks. In a moment, Mike will discuss with other Kendall delinquents their home, school, and family situations and talk about themselves. Now, let's hear from the voices of delinquency. You won't see the faces, you won't hear last names, but the words of these youngsters paint a vivid enough picture. The group is discussing drinking. Mike, our moderator, is asking the question of another boy also named Mike. What do you get out of drinking? Nothing. No, I think. It's just for kicks. It's for kicks. Marie, did you ever drink? No, I don't drink. How about you, Steve? Yeah. Don't. Drink? Why? Well, everybody else does, so it didn't seem hurt anything. Just to be with the crowd? Yeah. What about you? Once in a while, I had a beer. I didn't, I didn't like drinking too much. I didn't drink too much. Did your parents ever know that you drank? Uh-huh. What did they say about it? Well, my father, my father didn't like it. Some, sometimes, once in a while, he'd pour me a glass of wine, and he wouldn't say anything about he it. He wouldn't say anything. What about you? Well, most of the time, it'd be to a party. They have party? something to drink. Well, yeah, how, would, uh, to drink. how would you get the drinks? Usually, the kids just go to a party. Well, yeah. sometimes, you know, it would be a couple of guys in there who were giving a party, like it'd be a club. They uh, they work in a store, and they'll steal it out of the store where they work in. And they'll bring it to the house, and they, they just mix it in the punch, and everybody have a fall. Do you feel you should start drinking? I mean, no. No, you shouldn't start drinking. Harry, what do you think about it? Well, I never, I don't usually go around, you know, getting drunk, pretty loaded, you know. But I don't see anything wrong with just few drinks once in a while. I mean, that's, that's the only time I drink, it's just every now and then. Did your, Mike, did your parents let you drink? No. Uh, I was... I look like I was almost about beer. beer. Well, I'd have my real father buy it for me because he's an alcoholic and I buy him something, he buy me something. So that's the way it went. But in most bars in Miami, you can get beer at a adolescent age. In most little stores, too. You just go up and just give them the money and no questions asked. That's all. Let's get to parents. How's your parents? How's your family back at home, Mike? Well, for a while, for the last seven years, it ain't been too good. Uh, my stepfather was always gone, or he'd never sit down and discuss problems with me, stuff like that. So finally, he just left. What sort of your father to drink? Well, that I don't know. Did you ever try to talk to him to help him stop well, drinking? I told him to quit. He can quit if he wants to. In fact, he's in the hospital now. He hasn't had a drop for a month now. Marie, do you have a problem with your house? Well, when I lived with my parents, my mother and I and my father, we didn't get along at all because because they didn't agree with everything I said. I mean, we just didn't get along at all. Do you think drinking is a great influence on the teenager? Yes. Um, my mother drank a lot. I mean, she wasn't a drunk or anything, but she drank a lot. And her personality and her attitudes changed completely. Two men who work each day with delinquents are Dr. Ben Shepard, Dade County Juvenile Court Judge, 
and Dr. Richard Emerson, director of the Dade County Child Guidance Clinic. Dr. Shepard, we've been listening to that discussion. Do you find that drinking is closely associated with delinquency? I believe that drinking is closely associated with delinquency. I believe these children learn the pattern of drinking from their parents at home. And I believe that it's now gotten to be the style amongst the youngsters to go out and get drunk. I believe, and I know that we are seeing youngsters from the junior high school age on with reports of drunkenness and unconsciousness from drink, and I feel that adults are being told to or bribed to buy the liquor for these children, which they should never do, and they come out and with one dollar they can send a man into a store and get six, twelve, twenty-four cans of beer, and away they go. Well, Dr. Emerson, uh, what reason would there be for a child to start uh, drinking? Well, there could be many reasons for different children. Uh, certainly seeing it at home is a powerful encouragement, especially if, if the child himself is uh, not mature enough to have his own values about something like this. Another thing is certainly the fact that uh, other children may drink. It's a matter of prestige and importance and whether you can get away with doing the things that, uh, that the grown-ups are well known to do. Let's get back now to our discussion and pick up the topic of automobile theft. Get to auto theft. What do you think about stealing a car, Mike? Well, I used to steal cars. Uh, we'd take them out and everybody would strip them. Take the parts back in a truck and sell it for money. But after a while, it got where it was too risky, so we cut it out. Were you ever worried about getting caught? No. Marie, that auto theft, did you ever be involved in any cars? No. Steve? Yes. I stole it. Did you use the parts from the car, or just took it because you wanted to? No, I just took it for the fun of it, drive it around. Gary? Well, I, I did the same when I, I just, when I stole a car. I'd never used it for transportation, just when, we, when my friend and I went to wrestling. We got bored, and we went out, and we stole this car, and just for your ride. Well, most of the times, with friends of mine, but I'll be with them, they'll steal the car, and after they don't want to take it back or dish it, so I tell them, let's strip it. Dr. Emerson, uh, what about this matter of, of car stealing? What, what is a, a youngster, what, what does he get out of doing that? Well, if you have a car, or at least if you drive a car, it shows that you um, have the ability to get hold of a car and get away with that, but also it puts you in a class with the grown-ups. It gives you uh, the excitement of speed. Uh, it gives you a very real social competition with uh, other children. After all, the rich people can have cars, the poor people can't, and they may have to take them for themselves. It's a status symbol, then. Uh, Judge Shepard, do automobiles figure into much of the difficulty that comes before your bench? I would say about 50% of the children who come before the bench are for stealing cars. And I feel, again, that this is just a status symbol, and I feel these youngsters, many of them are doing it just for kicks, and I do feel, too, that these children, the driving age on these children should be elevated to 14 to 16 to 16 to 18. Parents should be more careful what they do with their own cars, and that way we can guard against it. The discussion now centers around the matter of teaching in school and the teachers holding grudges. Marie, what do you think about the teaching at your school? Well, there's they're strict with us, you know, when it comes to homework, you know, like at homework, you know, if we don't have it, you know, we get an F, you know, for the whole week. You think your teachers are good teachers or poor teachers? They're, they're fairly good. Fairly good. What are their demands on work? Is it something out of work you have to hand in a day? Oh, yes. You know, you know, you have to turn an assignment every day or, or, you know, like once a week a project or whatever it is. What do you think about teachers holding grudges against a student? I know some teachers in our school, if they don't like you, you fail. I know. Uh, I was one day, uh, you know, I had my hair blonde, and so he didn't like bleach blondes. And he just, he wouldn't like me for anything. So he just failed you because he didn't yeah. like bleach blonde. Mm -hmm. Steve, you ever had any troubles with your teachers? Yeah, I used to have trouble with all my teachers. They all had grudges against me. Why, is it something that you did to the teachers, or they just didn't like you? No, because I just did, never did any work. And I just didn't like it because you didn't yeah. do any work. Uh, all right, uh, Jerry? Well, uh, I never got along with my teachers. Uh, one reason 
because uh, like when the teacher turned his back I used to do a lot of trouble I used to agitate him and uh, I used to make a fuss and when everybody was doing their work I used to distract attention and uh, I was uh, I was I was making a lot of trouble in school and my teachers uh, didn't like me for it and um, I, I got into a lot of trouble for it and most of the time uh, when they sent me down to the dean's office he wouldn't he he what they weren't too strict with me over there he says you do it again and i'll give you a pattern well judge shepherd uh is this true the youngsters seem to think they're in the right the teachers are in the wrong many of them come in complaining that the teacher or some specific teacher has a grudge against him that's why he won't go to school and my reply to that always is that if the youngster conforms and tries to do his best the teacher won't know he's there and the teacher does not want to spend 90% of his time on the non-conformist when the, and 10% to the conformist. But Dr. Emerson, there are many students, of course, in a classroom, and when you have one troublemaker, I suppose it's difficult to give him the attention he needs. This is certainly true. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes when the children complain about teachers, it's rationalization, and partly they may be blaming the teachers for the things they don't feel, wouldn't feel right about saying about their own parents. But it's also true that these children uh, need individual personal attention and can't get it in a classroom and their efforts to get it are uh, Such that they can disrupt the class and make things very difficult for teachers Our group next discusses the conflict within the home with the parents yes. Well when I was um, Before I went to school, I mean I was real happy. I lived with my grandparents and we got along just fine We never argued or nothing and I really felt like they really cared about me and everything and when I started school, I went to private school when I was the first, you know, elementary school. And I liked that, too. It was real nice, you know, nice kids and everything. And then as I got older, it was about 10, I, I started living with my mother, and that's when, that's when it started. How did it start? Well, I mean, my mother and I, we just didn't know each other. And we, all of a sudden, she gets this, this child, you know, 10 years old, and she doesn't know anything about her, and I didn't know anything about my mother. And so we... I mean, we didn't know, we didn't know each other, that, that was the main thing. Do you feel uh, being separated from your mother caused a block between you and her? I do, because, I mean, she, she had some other children by my stepfather, and there's no trouble there. Just with you? That's right. Marie? Well, when I was adopted when I was a small child, when I was a baby, in fact, and uh, my mother had a set way of how she was going to raise me, and I was going to be a lady, you know, and so I just rebelled to this you know, as I grew up, because she was so overprotective. Do you feel um, this could cause your delinquency now? Yes, you know, I mean, that's what I think has caused me, you know, because I rebelled too much. Because your mother was always trying to baby you? Yes, uh, I was a mama's girl. How about you, Steve? Well, when I was, before I started going to school, I had a pretty, I had a good family life, because, you know, we could always, I was small, and we used to go places together and everything. Then, as I got start going to junior high school and you start hanging around the wrong crowd and before you know it, you start getting in trouble and everything. And Do you fine. feel it was uh, your parents' fault that you got in trouble or yours? No, it was my fault. Did your parents try to help you? Yeah. You know. Well, we see there, Dr. Emerson, uh, some of the girls felt that the trouble was in the home. The last boy said everything was fine at home. It was his own fault. Uh, what, what part did the parents actually play in this delinquency matter? Well, sometimes it's irrelevant uh, who the family members blame. Uh, they're all in it by the time the problem is, is, uh, has emerged. Uh, certainly, uh, children can become delinquent simply through parental neglect. They can also, uh, perhaps to the surprise of many of us, be enticed into delinquency because uh, the parents have themselves some angry feelings or some rebellious feelings, and they don't mind a bit if the children express them. Judge Shepard, what final word of advice would you have to give uh parents based on your experience on the bench? I would say that the parents should concentrate and let the children feel that they are wanted and accepted and loved and I'd say finally that it is not the quantity of hours they spend with the children but the quality of, the, of love they give them when they are with them that will direct the child's steps in the right way. We'll be back with more in this FYI report, Voices of Delinquency, in a moment. You have heard from a handful of delinquent youngsters, kids in trouble. It should be apparent that juvenile delinquency cannot be prevented or cured by passing a law. Individual action is required on the part of all of us. While it is true that Dade County has much less delinquency than other cities of comparable size, 
we must admit the amount we do have is too much. Listening to the delinquents, it is clear that the parents have the greatest responsibility in properly molding their own children. The job cannot be foisted off on the school, the church, or the community. The schools have performed well here in meeting the needs aggravated by our expanding population. The churches have also been active. But aside from the adult responsibility as parents, there is another role to be played by adults in preventing delinquency by working together to overcome the root causes in homes and the community which predisposes some youngsters to delinquency. Now, the community school plan is a good one to adopt here, to use the school as a community center for the entire family during non-school hours. This has worked well in Flint, Michigan. It's working well now at one school in Miami, Ada Merritt. We also have many organized groups in this town. They are made up of people genuinely interested in children. But these groups have not been able to keep pace with the constantly expanding need. Many of them work independently of one another, and there's much duplication and overlapping of function. Dade County needs a more unified approach. Thus, it is our suggestion that a youth commission be established here, made up of all interested agencies working with the prevention, control, and treatment of delinquency, which means groups working with youth. Much needs to be done in the way of research and supplying youth services. Recreation is lacking. Kids shouldn't be bundled up on mattresses on the floors of youth hall. Dependent children should not be intermixed with delinquents at Kendall. More outlets for activities should be provided to adults who want to help kids in trouble. The Dade Welfare Planning Council on April 15th will undertake a study to determine how a more coordinated youth program can be evolved. We would suggest a youth commission. They have been successful in many other American cities. We would also suggest that many of the civic and government leaders of Miami who daily worry and work toward solving our problems of traffic, industry, tourism, and highway beautification, put greater emphasis on preventing delinquency, devote more time, effort, and money on youth, this community's greatest resource. Good night. Voices of Delinquency. Another in a series of FYI programs for your information has been brought to you by Chase Federal Savings with five convenient offices to serve you. Why don't you join the thousands who say, for my money, it's Chase Federal. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, 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 oh.